So this morning, I want to just to continue a little bit on, we've been talking about breakthroughs for a while, different aspects, and when I, when I put this together, or when I felt that we should talk about breakthroughs, it was quite interesting that I didn't actually really know where I was going to go, but I had some ideas of stations along the way. Unfortunately, I've not even touched any of them. And this morning is still the same. So, if you haven't got a Bible, if you want to turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, it's a famous encounter that Jesus has with the woman at the well. And I'm going to take on the last bit of it. But Jesus is walking through Samaria. Now, normally, Jews didn't walk through Samaria from Galilee to Jerusalem. They would go the long way around. But Jesus chose to go through and he got to Samaria. And he sat down at a well and a lady comes out, you can read the story. And the lady comes out and he says, can you give me some drink because I don't have anything to draw with. If you have an old uh, good news Bible, you just have the picture in at chapter 4 of Jesus sat at the well with a lady carrying her pot. And at the side of the well was a bucket. So Jesus said, I have nothing to draw with, but in the good news Bible they drew it with a bucket. But that's just one of those little things. <laughs> Odd, but and the death disciples then going to buy food and then they come in and we're going to jump in chapter 4 and verse 27. So he's been talking to the lady, he's, she's run back off and it says just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked what, are, what do you want or why are you talking to her? Then leaving her water jar the woman ran back to the town and said to the people come and see the man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Meanwhile, the disciples heard him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. Then his disciples said to each other, could somebody have brought him food? My food, says Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you, have to, don't you have a saying, still four more months till the harvest, I tell you, open your eyes and look up at the fields, they are ripe unto harvest. So Jesus is talking to the lady, she then runs back, tells everybody what's been going on, they're coming back, and the disciples who, well, let's face it, had been with Jesus a while and should have been thinking of heavenly things as well as earthly things, are thinking of their stomachs. They're hungry, they've got some food, they're coming to Jesus and say, Rabbi, eat some food, because we're hungry, you must be hungry. I don't know if it's a case of, have you ever been to somebody's house where you're all sitting there waiting for everyone to sit down, you're starving, and you wait for that last person to sit down, and you're just about to tuck in and someone says, let's say grace, and you're going, okay. And then they go on that long that your salad warms up and your dinner goes cold. It's like, any up, will you? You can imagine the disciples thinking, we're hungry, come on, let's have some food. And they said to Jesus, have some food. And he said, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And I think there's a real lesson here in these few verses that we can learn. Because often we think of our needs, our physical needs, and they are important. We think of circumstances that's going on in our lives. But yet, there's something that goes beyond that. And Jesus says, I have food you know nothing about. Then his disciples asked each other, could somebody have brought him food? Still thinking the physical. And Jesus said, my food, said Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You know, sometimes if I'm busy doing something for God or I know there's a God encounter going on, there's something, there's a situation, I can go for hours and hours, even sometimes days without really eating because I'm focused upon God. If you ever fast, usually the first day kills you, the second day you is really bad and the third day you wish you were dead and by the fourth day you've kind of worked that through a little bit but when for me personally when I'm doing things for God and if I'm fasting it kind of doesn't affect me for a few days and I start to understand what Jesus meant yeah we need food we need to look after our bodies we need to eat but we need to do the will of the Father we need to do what God said we've got circumstances going on in our lives but we still need to do the will of a father. In fact, doing the will of a father will actually help you get through everything else. Amen. Doing the will of a father, doing what Jesus is to, or doing what the Holy Spirit is saying to you, will actually help you get through everything else. 
I mean, I heard somebody recently, and I've taken me some board and resharpened my axe, as it were. They said spending five minutes at the beginning of the day will save you a lot of time at the end of the day. When I wake up, I don't turn to Joe and say good morning. I'm often saying good morning, Jesus. I'm talking to Jesus as I'm stirring, as I'm working. When I'm going to sleep at night, I'm saying good night, Jesus. He's my best friend. He's the one who's there always with me by the Holy Spirit. He's the one who's always been with me. I, I sometimes sense him, other times I don't, but I know he's there. Amen. And yet sometimes for many of us, we can spend days, sometimes weeks, without even talking to the Holy Spirit. It's like having somebody with you in the car, I've heard this story, having somebody in the car on a 20-minute journey and never even talking to him. And yet he's there all the time. But we're busy. We've got things going on. And Jesus, yes, probably needed to eat, yet he was doing the will of the Father. It's amazing when you, you have a, one of those God incidents in your life. And I've been talking to God a lot recently about breakthroughs and, and in trying to encourage breakthroughs in my own life and helping you have breakthroughs in your life. And he reminded me this week, I was in the park and I was walking the dog and I was praying. I remember every, every breakthrough starts with an encounter with Jesus by his Holy Spirit. Everything we need starts with an encounter with him. I mean, there's nothing wrong with going to a doctor, but are we asking Jesus first about it? There's nothing wrong with asking um, about talking about situations, but I have to say, God, what, what do you think I should do? Sometimes more out of courtesy than anything else, but trying to bring him into the conversation, trying to bring him in. You see, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the Father who sent me and to finish his work. We've all got a job to do, I keep telling you, God's got a plan for us, He's got a purpose for us. And that needs to be finished in our lives, to, for God to, be fully, to fully do what he's got for us. We need to engage with encounters with the Holy Spirit and to walk close to God. And that's in addition to everything else that's going on. Many, many years ago, I um, used to be out talking to people about God. I still do and I still love it. And yet I come across many people that said, you "No, know, God's called me to this. God's called me to that. God's called me to, to do this and God's called me to do that. But I realised over the years that we're all called to pray. We're all called to worship. You don't have to be called to be a worship leader, but we're called to worship. And we're all called to be witnesses. See, Jesus went on and he said, don't, don't you ever say it's still four more months until the harvest. Yet I tell you, open your eyes and look. For the fields are ripe unto harvest. A couple of weeks ago I told you that I'm going to confess a mistake that I've made. Hey, I make them as well, you know. Cook me and I bleed, and it's not blue, it's red. I'm like you. I'm not any super person at all. I'm like you. But I made a mistake, a big mistake. And I'll get to it in a moment because you're thinking, Facebook, quickly. Record this one. You know, over the last, I'm going to get the box. Over the last few months, we've been praying uh, for the people's names that we've put in here. And every Sunday we pray for them and I, I still pray that you're, or still ask that you keep praying for these people. But this is a problem, this is a mistake. I've asked you guys to put names in this box, which is right. And I've asked you to pray for these people. I don't know, I've got to be careful because we do need to pray for these people. But I don't know if that's the entire story. Because Jesus says, look, open your eyes, um, the fields are white unto harvest. If we jump into Matthew, Matthew 9, 35, it says, Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages, teaching in the signals, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, of, uh, of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless. If there's a nation that's harassed and helpless, it's ours. At the minute, I mean, probably the world is harassed and it's helpless. Jesus had compassion on both people, and Jesus has compassion on our people, and Jesus has compassion on the world, and yet we don't have much compassion <coughs> flowing through us. And he says this, because they were harassed like sheep without a shepherd. And then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are free, few. So he says, look in John, look, the harvest is ready. Then he says in Matthew, the harvest is plentiful, but, plentiful, but the workers are few. And if you jump into Luke, 
was shopping all over. I don't hear pages moving, so you must be moving your thumbs. Luke 10, verse 1 and 2 says this. Luke 10, verse 1 and 2 says, After this the Lord appeared, uh, uh, appointed 72. So these are not the disciples. These are the people that's on the fringes now. He appointed them, uh, uh, 72 of us, and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and place where he was uh, about to go. And he told them, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We've heard that. And then he says this, Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into the harvest field. We are never told to pray, Jesus saved that person. We are told, this is a mistake I think I've made, I've encouraged you to pray, Lord save that person. But yet the Bible says, Lord send me. He never says pray that that person comes in. He says pray that you go out. That you talk, that you speak. Pray. Yes, pray God. Give them an encounter. Do pray God soften their hearts. Lord, do. give me a chance, Lord, to speak to them. Give me an opportunity. I've got five names in there. And to be honest with you, since we put them there, I have not seen these people. But I'm praying that God give me an encounter. Give me an encounter with them. Give me a, a, a moment with them. But God says it starts by having an encounter with me. Have an encounter with me. And then when you have an encounter with them, it will change their lives. Because there'll be something on me that affects them. The other night we were having a meeting and somebody <coughs> came in and I said to him, have you been around people who've been smoking? And we went, yeah. Because you could smell it on the clothes. When you spend time with Jesus, when you spend time with those, these, these terms are interchangeable. You do understand, don't you, that God the Father is on the throne in heaven. God the Son, Jesus, is at the right hand of the Father. And the one that's with us down here, we have to say it's Jesus, it, it's the Holy Spirit. We get that, don't we? So they're interchangeable, and the Bible does say, I will send the Holy Spirit. It talks about the Spirit of Jesus, it talks about the Spirit of the Father. It's not a good time to get into the Trinity, but it is God, all three in one. So they're interchangeable a little bit. But how often do we spend time with God so that it has an effect on other people? You see, we're praying for people. We're praying that people get saved. We're praying that, you know, God moves. But before God can move out there, he needs to move in here. And before he can move in our church, he's first got to move in here, in me, which is scary. But also in you. I've been reading up about the Welsh Revival. And Ellen Roberts there. Uh, totally changed Wales around. But what we don't often find out and read is that he was so committed to God. And he was so poured out before God. But he, would just, he just would be there before God. Months, years before the, the revival started. He'd be before God. He wanted his own encounter. Before he could carry an encounter to other people. An interesting few verses in Romans, Romans 10, verse 12 to 15. It starts off with this. There is no distinction between Jew or Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and bestows his riches on all who call upon him. Or in some verses it says, who richly blesses all those who call upon him. I like that because I call upon him. You know, not just for blessing. I want to get to understand I, lo I love the stuff that God gives me. I appreciate everything he's given me. But the things God's given me, the things, the things that have come into my life that I have from him, I kind of pale without him. The stuff that we're, that's why I worship songs, it's not about the song itself. The song is only a tool to get you in front of Jesus. It's there to get you almost face to face, if that's the right term. The songs we sing, the meetings we have, it's so that we can encounter God together. We can come before him. We can stand there with him. We can just gaze in him. And sometimes it's more, I'm standing over there thinking, okay guys, um, it's this time, thinking it's this time and, and we need to do this and we need to do this and I'm knowing what I'm speaking and what's going on. And all, almost the Holy Spirit says to me, he goes, uh, is this meeting about your agenda or me? <laughs> I guess it's about you. So shut up then, so I did. It was like, okay, you know what I mean? 
I'll just back, you know, not about, but it's like sometimes I need to refocus, even at those times it's about you. It's not about me. Tonight I just want to maybe spend some time praying with people to be filled with the Holy Spirit if they've never been filled with the Holy Spirit or to be refilled and re-energized by the Holy Spirit that we encounter God. And I don't really know what's going to happen I hope it's going to do some songs for us, but I just want to spend time before God and say, God, we're here. We're here. <laughs> God, we're here. You know, one of the first prayers of old Roberts used to be, you know, send the Holy Spirit for Jesus' sake. Send the path and send more power of the Holy Spirit for Jesus' sake. And it's my cry because we are Pentecostal after all, whatever that really means. We're scared we're all biblical. Whatever, when we're digging into that, we need God to touch lives. Because see, you and I can't save anybody. It's only the Holy Spirit that draws people. Amen. But the Bible says it's God's will that none perish. Yeah. You know your family members, it's God's will that they do not perish. Yeah. You know your work colleagues, it's God's will that they do not perish. Yeah. It's God's will that people in our nation do not perish. Your neighbours, it's God's will that they do not perish. Even the people you don't like, it's God's will that they don't perish. <laughs> The person you're not getting on with, it's God's will that they do not perish. And yet we sometimes would like to pray God send them to hell. And yet God says, I love them. The person that cuts you up, the person who's nasty to you, God loves them. There's no distinction between <coughs> Jew or Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all who blesses everyone who calls on him. For anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? So he's asking a question. How can people call upon God if they do not believe in him? And how can they believe in him whom they have never heard? And how can they hear about him unless somebody preaches? And how can they preach unless somebody they are sent? And as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. I'm a preacher of good news. Do you know why? Because I've got gorgeous feet. <laughs> I have. I really have. Joe says my feet are amazing. I've been to the Shropodis. I will talk to the Shropodis and she'll look at figure. They had nice feet. <laughs> They've been coming up all the time. But I have nice feet because A, they are nice. And B, I bring good news. And it says how beautiful are those who bring good news. Now if you don't have nice feet, and let's face it, most people do not. Ugh, feet. You know, it's not a good subject. But at the end of the day, we are still preachers of good news. Now, don't get complicated on the, I'm not a preacher. Well, we've already found out that the harvest is ready and that the workers are few and pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out, send out the workers. And that doesn't mean, Lord Jesus, send out Johnny. Because I can't reach everybody, but we can. We can. We can go out there. We can preach the gospel. Now, again, don't even get around my idea. The word preach means to proclaim. All I'm doing now is proclaiming. Hi. Good news. Jesus is alive. That's proclaiming. That's it. I reckon more people tell about their holidays than they do Jesus. I've heard people come back off their holidays and tell them everything that's happened. Not that we're interested. But they tell them everything that's happened with enthusiasm. And then you ask him, what did you do on Sunday while I went to church? I went to a, um, pick the kids up on Friday night. Guys, I think sometimes you are so blessed. You really are. The stuff that's coming to our church is setting you guys on fire. I went to a church to pick up my kids and I was talking to a guy and I said, how are you getting on? Bad move. He, I mean, he was telling me some stuff and I'm ready to get a rope for him. <laughs> I'm tying these knots for him, getting it ready, you know what I mean? Shall we, shall we hang it up a tree? <laughs> so depressed, so de works this and works that and this and that and it's going on. And I turned around and said, that might be the truth, but the truth beyond that is you are more than a conqueror. Amen. And he looked at me and went, what? <laughs> and this is the same guy, kids in church, been there for years. He goes, what? I goes, you, as a man in Jesus, are more than a conqueror. And he went, what are you on about? I said, the Bible says you're more than a conqueror. <coughs> really? I said, read Romans 8. I said, you can overcome. 
you are so you are blessed he goes i am not blessed i goes yes you are the bible says you are and he goes but i'm not i goes you know what i am i said are you a christian he said yeah i said you're blessed he goes no i'm not i goes you need to read the word of god and then i went what the heck are you being taught and i know the church is part of and i'm thinking Okay, he just said, Johnny, I've never heard. I started taking him through some stuff and he's going, I've never heard this before. This is stuff, that's the basic stuff. And yet, he didn't know it. So, we need to just proclaim it because how can people hear about Jesus unless somebody tells them? You know, nobody really, there might be the odd one, goes to a phone box if they exist anymore or finds a tract and reads it and falls down on their knees and gets saved. That's rare. It's rare that people, you know, suddenly wake up one morning and go, I need to know Jesus and go on the internet. It's rare. What they're looking at is people. Looking at people like you. Ordinary people. You can say, Johnny, you're okay, you're a pastor, you've got a good title to get into. Plus, I take my dog for a walk. And when I'm taking my dog for a walk, I do not look like a pastor. You know, with the ball dead, walking up, walking up the street with a dog that growls at anybody and wheezes on everything. And I'm desperately trying to get him to the field and to the wood before he drops anything because I don't want to pick it up. And we shoot up there past people and I'm smart. But I've been praying for my neighbourhood. I'm walking around praying for people. I'm stopping talking to them. I'm becoming a pastor to the streets around just by asking how they're getting on. How's your day been? Spending a moment, a minute, 30 seconds. And I'm busy. But yet taking time out is just making a difference in people's lives. But I'm walking with my dog and I get onto the field and, and the dog runs off and does his business and he comes flying back because another dog walked on with a guy and that puts him on the lead and he's happy and he's alright, he's sniffing around. And this dog jumps on my dog and you know, if anyone's seen Baxter, if you don't know, he's a German Shepherd and he's, he's not quite that small. And this boxer jumps on him and Baxter just jumped back on him and pinned him to the floor and grabbed his neck and he's growling and they're going, okay, so I drags off Baxter and this other dog jumps and went straight back for him so Baxter decked him again and I'm going, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Come back, Baxter. Yes. You know what I mean? My dog. But, I mean, he's all right, but both okay. And Joe says to me, just take the dog for a quick walk because we need to go somewhere. An hour later, because this guy says to me, well, I said to him, how are you doing? And he says, I'm not doing so good. For over an hour, I got a chance to talk to him about him and his grandkids and about Jesus. And it was amazing because some Jehovah's Witnesses, because we walked out of the park by now, and some Jehovah's Witnesses walked past. And he says to me, what's the difference between you as a Christian and them? Because when they knock on my door, he said, I tell them I'm a Satanist. I says, I tell them I'm... You know, a born again Christian, spirit filled, born again, um, you know, operating in the gifts, that usually makes them run anyway. I said, yes. Yeah. So he said, what's the difference? I said, they don't believe Jesus is God. I was leading somewhere by now. It was like the Holy Spirit was just inspiring me to, to get into a point. And then I said, they don't really believe that everybody will go to heaven. And I know that's an interesting thing in itself. I said, they don't believe in hell. They don't believe people go to hell. We do. I said, but they believe. You've got to earn your salvation. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, as Christians, we believe that Jesus died on the cross. He was buried. He was resurrected. And he ascended to the right hand of the Father. And he did it all. And he gives it all to us as a gift. We can't earn it. We can't pay for it. There's nothing, and everybody would say, amen. That's the good news. Yeah. He said, but how's that work? Why do you do good things then? I said, in appreciation for what he's done. He said, but they do good things to get saved. I knew doing something similar. I said, no, no, no. We're saved and we do good things because of we're saved. Yeah. So I straight away I said, it's like somebody giving you a, an house. You dream out. Somebody comes along, there's an house there, you can have it. And on the day you move in, you pull your wallet out and say, there's 20 quid there, thank you. It's a bit of an insult, isn't it? And he said, I don't really get it. But he told me about his grandson. And it was like, this is what I mean about listening to the Holy Spirit. Listening to what God's saying to your heart. There's no great voice, oh, angels or anything like that going on. It's just a case of listen. And God reminded me that he'd mentioned his grandson and this nice car that he'd bought for his grandson, electric car. I said, it's like on Sunday, if your grandson comes to your house and wants to go in, your, in the car that you bought him, 
And you say, Grandad, Grandad, I've got 20 pence for you towards my car. How would you feel? And if he said, next week, Grandad, I'll bring you some more money till I've paid off for my car. What would that make you feel like? And he said, I'd be devastated. I said, why? He said, because it's a gift. I said, so how do you feel about that? He says, I'd be hurt. I said, what are you looking for? What do you want from your grandson because of that car? He said, I just want to see him smile. I want to see him say thank you. And I went, that's exactly what Jesus did. And he goes, I get it. I get it. I mean, he did fall on his knees, repented and get saved. That's my bit for another time. But he said, I get it. Do we get it? When he called our name and we come running out of that grave, do we get it? Do we get everything we're singing about? Do we get what we're reading about? You see, I've been looking at, I've been reading in Matthew and I've been in Acts and I'm going to go back into Acts. But I read Acts recently and I wondered if I was saved. I read Acts and wondered if I was saved. Now, I'm not, you know, we're all saved before God, but let's face it, there are some people that are enthusiastic about God. And there's some people you need to prod them to see if they're awake. You know, some people might say, Johnny, you're a little bit enthusiastic. You've been on the Red Bull, maybe. I get excited about Jesus. But when I read the book of Acts, I'm thinking, I don't even really near these people. All I see from the book of Acts is men and women of God relying so much on the Holy Spirit in their daily walks with God. Yeah. And yet for me, sometimes I get up and I say, yeah, how are you doing God? How are you doing Jesus? Let's have a great day and God's opening doors. But there's times where sometimes I even forget about it. Even when I'm preaching, sometimes I get them on me from, I just want to go, Holy Spirit just talk to me. I just want to go sit down somewhere. So I'd rather spend time with him than even preaching. I'd rather spend time with him than even eating. I'd rather spend time with him than really, dare I say it, and those cuddly moments with the wife. <laughs> Even though I like those moments and I like eating. You know, and I like preaching. But at the end of the day, that's the more important thing. Seeking his face is more important than anything else. Going after him is more important. And when we encounter God, that's when we'll see his heart for people. And then we'll start talking to other people about him. You see, witnessing is a, is a dirty word to a lot of people. But when you've met my Jesus... When you've, you've been with my Jesus, you won't be able to stop yourself. Yeah. When people spit at you, you look back in love at their eyes. And I'm not quite there yet. Yeah. When people abuse you or say something, when you've been with Jesus, you'll just want to care and love for these people. Yeah. How can we pray blessings on our enemies if we've not touched Jesus because it's so hollow otherwise? And that's what we're after. There's an interesting thing and I'm working this through. Acts 1 8, we'll jump onto that one. One of my favourite verses in the Bible. It's the first one anybody ever gave me, and I love it. It says, when the, You will be my witnesses when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Sorry, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you'll be my witnesses. I better read it, and that's going out of it. But you will receive power, that's it. Oh. This, is, this is, if I had Sam on guitar now, this would be one, you'll receive power. Boom! <laughs> Into the speaker. I haven't got air anymore, have I? We need you sometimes, though. Dan, our keyboard, no. We don't want to go to 10 meetings, do we? But you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Do you know what? I've witnessed in Jerusalem, I've witnessed in Judea, literally. I've been there. And I witnessed, I loved it. I've not been to Samaria, but I've been to the ends of the earth. But when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you'll, you'll become a witness. Not a witness that feels they have to. Guys, you know something? I never ever tried to force myself to witness to anybody. Never. But I just say to God, God, I'm ready. I'm ready for you. I'm ready. And I'm a bit of an evangelist, so you think, whoa. But I'm not joking. I just want, I want people to say, what's different about you? What's different? And I don't want to see me, I want to see Jesus. There's a couple who visited us um, some time ago, and they're at a church in Pontefract. And the testimony of that guy is, he says this, and uh, hear me right, he says, when I looked, I had a Leeds top on, and he were a Leeds fan, that's how we got talking. But he said, when I looked into his eyes, he said, I saw something I didn't have, I saw Jesus. 
And I'm thinking, that's good. Jesus shines out, opens our windows, shines out, he's looking. We get up in the morning, we open our curtains, and when we open our eyes, we need Jesus to shine out by the Holy Spirit. We want the smell of Jesus upon us so that we will receive power and the Holy Spirit comes upon us so we can be witnesses. Do you know you're a witness either way? Whether you witness for God or not, you're still a witness. You're a witness. You're a witness for God or you're a witness against God. That's it. Simple as that. You're either promoting the things of God or you're promoting the things of this world. There's an interesting verse in the Bible, I forgot what it is. It says, wake up, or sleep, and rise from the dead. Interesting verse. Number one, why would somebody be sleeping amongst dead people? Why would you bet your bed in dead people? And yet, Joe told me I can't use this thing, because I was going to go, I see dead people from that film that you're all going to think about now. I see dead people. But the truth is, we all see dead people. Anybody without Jesus is technically a dead person. But he says, wake up or sleep. Christians sleep when they die. Non-Christians die and are dead. So take that thing, that some people are sleeping amongst the, the world instead of shining a light. You know, there's a song by Keith Green and it says, um, don't you see, don't you see, all the people sinking down. Don't you care, don't you care, are you going to let them drown? And he says, we're spending too much, we're, we're <coughs> asleep in the light. Instead of being, we've got the light of Jesus and we're sleeping in the daytime instead of shining a light in the darkness to bring people out. Because we've got our own problems and our own circumstances and we don't have time really, do we? God, if you're really that important, why don't you just show yourself in the clouds and people will turn to you? Why don't you just give them a vision? Because he's called you and I. It's called you and me. Peter and John, at the end of Jesus' is resurrected in a story that comes right at the end of John's Gospel. John 21, verse 15 to 21. Guys are out um, fishing and Jesus is cooking breakfast and calls them in. So he says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me? I said, do you love me more than these? He says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my lambs. Now, most of you are very familiar with this. He says to him the second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? <coughs> he says to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, teach my, uh, tend my sheep. English standard version of this. He says to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon was grieved because he had asked him his third time, do you love me? He says to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. There's a lot of theology in there. A lot of people make great things out there. But something dawned on me recently when I read that. Jesus asked him, do you love me? And Pete said, yeah. And he said, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs, tend to my sheep, whatever. He said, do something. A shepherd who manages other people's sheep, cares for the sheep when there's no reward back. I believe Jesus was saying to Peter, do you love me? Peter said, yes. So he says, take care of my sheep. Do something that's not gonna reward you back personally, but do it for me. If you love me, do it for me. Tend to my sheep, look after. And I think this isn't for me, this is for us. Because Peter wasn't gonna get any reward from feeding the sheep. In fact, the next verse it talks about what's going to happen to him for feeding the sheep. He's going to get killed for feeding the sheep. Oh, that's good, isn't it? Feed the sheep, Peter, and then it's going to kill you. But sometimes we're so consumed in our situations, circumstances and problems and what's going on in our own lives when in reality, if we start feeding the sheep, if we start tending to people, if we start helping somebody else who's not going to give us any reward back, then maybe because we're putting the effort into somebody else's problem, situation, circumstance, then maybe God might just speed up on ours. You see, we want God to save our friends and neighbours, and sometimes you know, we need to be out there witnessing to them, but sometimes he might witness somebody else, and God might bring somebody else along. But it's interesting that verse 20 of, of John 21, 
He says, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following him. And he, uh, the one who leaned back against him during the last the supper, and he said, Lord, what's going to happen to us? Uh, sorry. After he said, Lord, who's going to betray us? It, then Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about that man? Jesus has just told Peter, do you love me? Yeah, feed my sheep. In other words, don't concern yourself about anybody else, anything, do what I'm asking you to do. John comes along and Peter goes, uh, what about him? What about him? Look, and then we read, it's got nothing to do with you. You see, we're sometimes so consumed in our problems, circumstances, situations, and Jesus is going, I understand what you, where you're at, but maybe you're where you're at because I've got something for, to, for you to do where you're at. Somebody to reach where you're at. I mean, Peter, I'm sorry, Paul, when he's preaching, he's out on the streets and in the cities, and so on, and then he gets locked up. He gets thrown in prison. What's he do? He tells them. It's like, it's like un unstoppable. He's outside doing it. He gets locked up and he's inside doing it. He, he part of the church from Philippi in a prison cell. And out he goes. He wasn't concerned about his situation. He said, I've, been, I've learned to be content with much and with little. See, we say we're blessed when we have much. When we haven't got much, we wonder what's going on. I've realised the stuff that God gives us can often be a distraction to him. We come before God sometimes and it's, Lord, give me, give me, give me, I need, I need, I need. The Bible says he already knows your needs and he will supply all your needs. You don't have to go begging for your needs, it says in the word of God, I will supply your needs. You thank him for he's supplying all your needs. But you need to go after his face. You need to go after him. And I've had some awesome encounters with God over the years, but they're kind of faded now. <laughs> faded. And maybe it's because I've got used to him. Maybe it's because I'm so used to him that I'm thinking, but when I watch people on the internet, or I watch, I'm trying to think of some preacher's names, Catherine Coleman. <laughs> Anybody heard of her? Mm. I mean, it was like she used to talk to the Holy Spirit like he was standing next to her. And she'd shut up and, and listen and then talk. I'm thinking, I just want to have that sort of relationship with you, Jesus. I just want that. The problem is that some people, when they get to the world, they become nutters. They were already nutters before that. That don't change. The fact is, if you went to a restaurant in Sober Bridge and they served bad food, would you stop going to all the other restaurants in Sober Bridge? No, you'd probably just stop going to that one. Just because there's one creative person who looks weird doesn't mean you don't have to go after the Holy Spirit. And I think the Holy Spirit is beckoning us on, is drawing us forward. If we want real breakthroughs in our lives, not temporary victories, but permanent solutions, where we win and we run through, we're knocking down the giants, not just knocking down, but we're killing them and moving on to the next one. It's walking daily with the Holy Spirit. It's walking daily in the presence of God. It's going after him with all your heart. Sometimes, sometimes we miss reading the word of God because there's something more important on the internet or on telly. But you'd never miss a meal for the telly. I heard something recently from Joyce Mayer. And she says, this, is Jesus your Lord or your part-time lover? Is Jesus your Lord or your part-time lover? Because Jesus is not into part-time lovers. Jesus is into, take up your cross, follow me. Jesus never said, I will follow you. He said, follow me. And then he sets off walking. But, but, but Jesus, I want to go and sort this out. He keeps on walking. <laughs> He's looking for men and women of God who are going to go after him at whatever cost it is. Whatever price to be paid, they're going to go after him. And if it kills you going after him, you're still going to get that eventually. But we often think that when we get to heaven, everything will be all right. It will be all right when you get to heaven. But why not get to know him here? So that when you get there, you're rewarded in all the things. Well, I just want to get there. 
Well, that's a very selfish attitude. Because, well, we're just saying, I just want to get there. I've got my ticket to heaven. I'm doing all right. What about our neighbours, our friends? And all we've got to do is, is shine. You don't have to knock on the door and give them a tract. I went to a church recently. I visited when I first got saved many years ago. I visited it again. And I was, re- I was telling the story about the, ta- the village I lived in. There was a lady there, and she was completely crazy. Um, I won't mention her name just in case she's still got the altars around. <laughs> but she, she used to run down streets throwing holy water, and you're going, you're going to get saved and throw water, holy water. And she'd try and put a cross on your forehead. And you know, nowadays, it class of child abuse. She used to just jump on people. My mum. You know, knocked her down, literally, several times because she kept coming after me, mum about her. And she was just a complete nutter. She was a person, when she walked out the door, you'd run. And I wouldn't even say, people were Satanists, just saying, we're Satanists, just to get away. But she was crazy. Maybe she was just very passionate. I don't know, look at it, it's a long time I've seen her. And I got saved and radically changed by God. And I went, I went in the house group and it was amazing. I've been taught about the things of God. I've been talked about it's good. You see, I got taught to read the Bible and believe it. So I did. So I believed that God heals. God heals. Never been a problem. Time. Time, okay. Good to church. Good to church. That's great. Never been a problem to me. It seems a lot of other people have different stuff. But anyway, I went to his church Sunday night. There's revival happening. People are getting saved every Sunday. People are getting spirit filled. They're getting healed, getting delivered. This is every Sunday night. God's moving. And then they men- mentioned it no to the Sunday morning meeting. So I go, I want to go to Sunday morning meeting. Because if this is church, I want to be there. Sunday morning was like an extreme opposite. If anybody remembers the Red Book, Redemption in Moon, it was four hymns, two prayers. And a sermon, and 20 minutes before communing, quietness. It was weird, but this woman was there, and when I saw her, I went, oh, I'm out of here, she's a nutter. I thought there were two churches in one building. I didn't want out to do with her. Maybe she was just passionate. Maybe she was, but you don't have to be weird, just be you. Just be you. But ask the Holy Spirit. You don't have to say, Holy Spirit, do I have to speak? Do I have to speak on Twitch? Getting, getting in an elevator, standing there going, Holy Spirit, do you want me to witness? Do you want me to witness? Lord, Lord, witness. Do you And someone's looking going, if you want to be weird, get in a lift and speak in tongues. People will be touching that button to get out of the next floor, I'm telling you. But you can be normal and real. I talked to a lady this week who just looked, I said, you're looking sad. I mean, what? That's not really a big open, is it? She did, she looked sad. I said, you're all right, you're looking sad. She said, I am. And she told me a story. And then it just led me to, to show a bit of compassion to her. I didn't have a three-point track sermon to give her. I said, I'm going to pray for you. I'm just going to pray for you. I walk past her house almost every day, twice a day sometimes, with my dog. She's going to see me. And every time she sees me, she's going to go, he's praying for me. He's praying for me. And then I've got to, if dog drops it outside, I'll have to pick it up now, won't I? I just can't walk off. Not that I do that, obviously, for those who are watching. But I think the Holy Spirit wants to spend more time with you and me than we want to with him. And so tonight, I just want to spend some time where we're going to pray for people and have a bit of time just before God. Because he's worth more than the football, he's worth more than the sport or whatever. Is worth it all. And guys, you've given your life over to give Jesus. We've read that verse. Those who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. You're going to go to heaven. Great. But I don't want to get to heaven and just be in the mediocre crowd. I definitely don't want to be in heaven in the smelling of fire crowd by the skin of my teeth, King James says. I like that saying. Just literally scraping in. I want to be the ones that Jesus, I know we've got that thing, well done, great. And, but actually, when you read that parable where it says, well done, great and faithful servant, it's on condition of what they've done. Not because they got there. I think that people who don't get well done, it'll be great to see you, come on in. I want the, this is my son, whom I'm well pleased, I love, whom I'm well pleased with. That's Jesus' thing. But we're his sons as well, all of us. And I want that. Is that selfish? 
Is that selfish? But I want you to have it as well. I want you to have an encounter with God because it's not just about the past and great. He has the encounter, we can all go on to the next level. No. I want you to have it. But it's not easy. It means getting up a bit earlier, which means going to bed a bit earlier. It means spending time. I'm, I'm reading the Bible more for me recently than you. Because all my reading sermons get all that sort of, but I'm reading it for me. And I'm stirring up because he says, don't forget your first love. Don't forsake your first love. Jesus said he'll never forsake me. But if you read Jeremiah chapter 2, he talks about a nation who turned their back on God. And in there there's a verse that says, oh, I'll paraphrase it, you know, can a woman forget her wedding day dress and, and jewellery, but you have forgotten me. <laughs> Let it never be said that I don't remind you to keep going after Jesus. Anyway, that's not a good thing to end on. Jesus wants to have an encounter with you. He wants to stir you up. He wants to set your hearts ablaze for him. He wants you to shine for him. And you're all looking panicky now. But he's not going to make you weird. If you get weird, it's because you were weird. But he loves you anyway. He loves you anyway. And when we focus on our situations, circumstances and problems, I think he's saying, do you love me? Well, Lord, you know I love you. Then prove it. Feed my sheep. Whatever that might be. Feed my sheep. Amen. Amen.